It's a colorized black and white photo. It's a painting. Oh. You know, back in the. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, we have a little bit of refreshments over in this corner, the sign in counter here, and then over in this area here. We actually have an exhibit of some of the materials that you'll be hearing about today and that we might incorporate in the, in the project that we're discussing here tonight. So um, I'm David Tojak, I'm the principal city engineer for the city of Oceanside, joined the city in 2007 and basically got involved with this project after conservation about 2013, I got involved with the project. So tonight's meeting is an introduction of the Bureau Bay Bridge and Lifeguard Headquarters Capital Improvement Project. It's uh, an introduction to you and people on um, Zoom. Um, and again, the purpose of the meeting is to update you on the status, what we've done, where we're looking for, what we're having to deal with, and how we're going to treat this aging structure. After we get through the little presentation here, uh, we want to hear from you. So we're going to give you guys an opportunity to speak out, ask some questions, and uh, move forward to support the piece of city infrastructure. It's actually an iconic uh, image of the city. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to the project manager, Dara Woods, in the back. Uh, she'll be a senior engineer here, and she'll be working with the design team, Moffat Nickel. Who is our uh, selected design consultant? Uh, Dara will be your point of contact for most information. She'll be kind of managing the web page information, getting the information out to the public. Uh, she's a good candidate for the project because she's also heading up the project that we have uh, currently going on around the pier, which is the community center and the uh, basically amphitheater. So that project is going concurrently with this project. So she's going to manage both those projects. Just for information, you're not aware of it, she'll be heading up a meeting. Uh, a week from tonight, next Tuesday, on the 31st, for that project. So, tonight we're going to focus on the Deer project. Now, with that, um, the information you will have available we have flyers for some of this. We also have our webpage updates. We have two locations in our, in our webpage that tell you about our CIP project in general. And then we have a link also, a webpage called Special News and Special Project and News, where you can find a lot about this information, get updates uh, throughout the life of the project. And with that, I'm going to turn the project over to Jared Cole. Jared Cole is the Moffat Nickel. He's our project manager, uh, design experience. Uh, he's going to discuss historic elements. And then at the end of the presentation, he's going to open questions to you and anyone else that have questions. Those listening on Zoom will be able to write in, maybe on chat or contact our or myself, and we'll be able to address your questions. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. My name is Jared Cole. I'm with Moffitt Nickel. Uh, I'm the prime consultant on this project. And uh, again, as Dave mentioned, uh, after the presentation, there'll be some time for QA. Uh, we have our landscape architect here at JT Bar, the Schmidt Design Group, um, our architect, Rick Espana, with RNT. Um, we have our uh, historic architect here, uh, Tom Saunders, with Heritage Architecture. Uh, we have Alex Ford here, our, our bridge engineer. And uh, Matthew Martinez, our, our principal in charge and uh, structural engineer. And finally, uh, Jason Reynolds uh, with DUNEC, uh, their head of the environmental uh, consultant for this project. Uh, so, an overview of this project uh, what is this project? So, this project is basically everything you see here outlined in red. Um, we have a 93 year old uh, bridge structure um, built in 1928. And, uh, and just to differentiate things, that, that concrete bridge structure uh, serves uh, the wooden and timber pier, uh, which is not part of this project. Um, our project also includes the lifeguard headquarters, which is located underneath here at uh, the west end of the concrete bridges. Uh, but also, uh, another point on here is the old restrooms that are built in as part of the concrete pier, which are now storage. That's something else that's that we're looking at and the area that's within that. Um, 
again, uh, our, our main points for this project are, you know, what's the future of the lifeguard facility? Uh, they need, they have a, a bunch of needs we're looking at. Um, we're looking at sea level rise, um, ADA access uh, for the pier and, the, and how that works with the overall site. Um, and then again, pier access, uh, obviously during construction, uh, you know, what are, you know, we don't want to sever access to the wood pier. How are we, how are we handling that? Uh, certainly taking into consideration the nearby businesses and uh, going through the environmental permitting process, uh, working with the Coastal Commission, and then obviously there are uh, a number of historical considerations. And uh, to head things off, uh, Tom here from Heritage is going to uh, go through some of the historic aspects of the structure. Uh, Tom? Hi, thanks, George. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Tom Saunders. Um, so I'm with Heritage Architectural Planning. Uh, I work alongside uh, David Marshall, who's the president of our firm, who also works on this project. Uh, he could be here today. But, um, uh, we're excited to be working on this project. Uh, we've worked on a couple of bridge projects before, including uh, the first Stanley Bridge and also the Trail Bridge uh, going over to Bobo Park. And we also recently completed here in Oceanside the Grace House project, which is more commonly actually known as the Top Gun House. Uh, so that was also for it. We're excited to uh, keep the history alive here in Oceanside and start working on this project. Um, so here we have the uh, pier structure, the bridge structure. It was built in 1927. Um, on the west hand side. Um, and a couple of other historic images here we see the example. Here under construction, um, we have the uh, bathrooms here. Uh, these were originally window openings into the bathroom. You can still see the window, which I'll cover later. Um, and you can also see that this is the grand opening of the uh, here again. I wanted to here. Uh, we have the uh, image on the right. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, <coughs> Really nice image showing that the pier was actually originally uh, exposed for full concrete. Uh, no paint finish, no other uh, showings at that time. Um, had the uh, nice pipe railings that we have here and some precast uh, concrete light posts running down uh, the length of the pier. Uh, and then here are the windows here that were built uh, above the those were generally down below the bed. Uh, at the west end of the pier, where the lifeguard station is, there actually used to be the Oceanside Municipal Dining Room. Uh, back in the day, what folks would do is go on the pier, catch some fish, uh, and then uh, eat what they caught in the Municipal Dining Room. The lifeguard stays, the walls that encapsulate uh, the dining room have since been removed and replaced with the uh, walls that constitute the lifeguard station. Uh, but the lifeguard station does occupy the Exact same footprint as the municipal dining room. Uh, so, this is just a brief chronology, chronology, chronology of the bed. Um, I really just a uh, few key points uh, that this is trying to uh, discuss. The first is that the pier exists in quite a um, tumultuous environment, the ocean environment. Uh, so, it's taken a thousand million years. Um, there's been six Generations of the wooden portion of the pier that's most not included in our project. Um, but that's been successfully uh, destroyed and rebuilt six times, the sixth version of the current version. Um, so, again, this is a building that's subject to some uh, high stress environment. Uh, second is that there's been a number of changes over the years. Uh, these include uh, um, changes to the uh, handrails, the pipe handrails. Uh, changes to the light posts that you can see concrete, pre-class concrete light posts have been replaced with metal light posts, uh, some of which uh, the location is missing. So there's, uh, there are some uh, light posts that are missing. Um, there's also other coatings that we added, uh, uh, the coating that was added in 1938, 
Um, and Gunite is a, basically a kind of a spray on concrete, uh, but it's added a, a layer of thickness to appear. Uh, and there's also a lot of neo elastomeric coating with a touch to finish on the tier. Um, that again covers the original um, exposed concrete finish. Uh, and the final point is just um, I would say again, this is a high stress environment, and uh, concrete patching has occurred multiple times at the bridge. There's a lot of spoiling, a lot of cracking going on in the bridge. Uh, and so um, there's been a lot of patch and repair uh, done. So here's the theory as it stands today. Again, the, um, what we see on the surface now is not obviously the exposed uh, concrete that was original to the structure. Uh, now we see very clearly the uh, textured elastomeric paint that uh, was with the white uh, finish. Uh, here's just an example, a, a brief example of some of the damage onto the uh, right hand image. This is quite consistent throughout the throughout my point over here. Uh, on this image, you can actually see uh, the layer of dynamite that's been applied to the bridge um, and the elastomeric paint that's on top again. This is a finish that is not original and is covering the original um, surface of the, air, of the bridge. Uh, here are the windows that I was discussing earlier. Again, um, originally uh, there were six windows that go to the central window. I believe these are now used for storage. But originally they were a bathroom facility. Um, just another couple of changes. We have um, the balustrades. Originally, they actually were individually precast sections that were installed into the bridge. Um, this has since been these uh, little gaps here have since been infilled by the dynamic coating. Um, so again, the, the original appearance of the bridge has been modified. Uh, here on the right, I see the original uh, precast concrete. Um, light posts. Again, those have been replaced with metal light posts. Uh, and again, the pipe railing. Uh, this is the original design from the original drawing. Uh, and this is what is there today. So we have had two uh, construction options available to us uh, reconstruction and restoration. Uh, both of these are similar in their uh, uh, goals and their final goals, which is to restore the bridge to a, 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 a period accurate uh, representation, uh, so a historic accurate representation of the bridge um, through different means. Uh, restoration obviously is, is keeping the bridge intact, uh, and reconstruction would be, is that what it is, is reconstructing um, the bridge. Um, reconstruction offers, it, it may be a little um, confusing, but uh, reconstruction actually offers us advantages, but restoration is not going to offer us. And I'll uh, run through that in the next slide here. Um, the, one of the, the critical issues is that with restoration, obviously the bridge will remain um, along with it, all of the problems will remain, which include the spoiling, the, the uh, issues of the rebar, uh, and they will simply be encapsulated. Uh, with the mitigation methods that we would have to incorporate for both site site retrofitting and structural uh, retrofitting. Um, and this would also, again, modify the uh, historic appearance of the, of the bridge uh, because certain portions would have to get wider to incorporate uh, the mitigation methods that we would have to install. Um, and so that's just a quick rundown of some of the advantages in, uh, of between the two uh, processes. Um, so in restoration, obviously, the most historic fabric would be the most historic fabric would be the same. Um, in uh, reconstruction, we would get the greatest possible service life. We're looking at 75 to 100 years. Uh, in restoration, we're doing it 50 to 60 years. Now again, in reconstruction, uh, we're afforded the uh, greatest opportunity to return the bridge to its original historic appearance. Uh, in restoration, this would be hampered by um, adding all of the stuff that we need to add uh, to the exterior of the structure. In reconstruction, all of the seismic and structural retrofitting that would be required uh, could be incorporated into modern, modern materials and methods, and that would be hidden within the structure, uh, which would allow us to retain the historic appearance of the grid. Um, that, that kind of opens 
second point that has electrical cycle strengthening that would only give you construction. Um, it's important to know that both uh, reconstruction and restoration, uh, the eligibility for historic preservation would be maintained. So that's the same across both uh, aspects. Um, and again, reconstruction would be our best return for investment, it gives back for our buck, uh, because again, uh, it gives the biggest service life and would uh, remove all of the existing problems that we have to face, keeping the existing bridge. Tom, uh, part of uh, part of our project and past work on this structure has involved uh, a lot of inspection work. Uh, back in 2006 and 2007, we were hired by the city to do a, a pretty thorough uh, investigation of the condition of both the timber pier and the, the concrete bridges here. And, uh, and again, uh, very, uh, very thorough investigation involved man lifts. Uh, we went over every inch of the surface of the, of the structure back then. And uh, part of that work uh, included taking a bunch of concrete core samples um, throughout the structure. Um, and uh, what we're looking at with those core samples is uh, to see how far along the chloride content or Think of it like salt uh, as it intrudes into the, the concrete structure. Um, and one thing of note is uh, there's a threshold where you get a salt content or a chloride content that starts the corrosion process in the reinforcing seal. So I guess you know concrete structures they they, they use reinforcing seal inside, and when that starts to rust, it starts to expand, it starts to create spalls, and that's a lot of the issues we've been seeing on this structure that's uh, that's now 93 years old, and so what is in that concrete that back in this is 13 years ago from our testing is you know we had chloride contents or salt contents in concrete up to 14 times that threshold, and part of that problem is that that salt remains; it's still in the concrete, and so the, these problems and this corrosion will continue to occur. Um, Back in 2016, 2018, I don't know if you, if you all recall, but uh, at one point, uh, a series of nets that were suspended from the concrete pier. There was so much uh, debris that was falling off. And so the city went through a, uh, a patching program to address, to address all that. Um, and it, was, uh, it was pretty thorough. Um, and it, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, really just to mitigate the concrete, the, the risk of concrete falling on the public, especially there along the Strand Way. But, you know, again, it was, a, it was not really a structural repair, it was patching, and it was a stopgap measure. And I guess the point of this is that the, this deterioration is continuing. Um, uh, right here, for example, this is from a couple months ago, our, our our friend, uh, the lifeguard captain, uh, Bill Curtis, uh, this chunk of concrete fell out of the ceiling above his desk and landed on his desk. And uh, again, if you guys want to check it out, it's over there on the back table. Um, yeah, this is in the lifeguard station. This is just a couple months ago. Um, here's a view inside one of the old restroom areas or storage areas. And again, you can see, uh, you know, uh, you can see here that. You know, the concrete continues to fall out of the ceiling. And uh, you know, here's this whole section suspended by the elastomeric coating on the ceiling. So, again, while this that sort of stuff was repaired back in 2016, 2018, you know, it's just going to continue to happen all over the structure. Uh, another thing we looked at uh, a couple of years ago were the seismic deficiencies of the structure, looking at uh, Structural details again, the structure is built 93 years ago. Uh, the modern design codes have changed, the detailing has changed, and kind of one thing of interest on this slide here uh, again, here's the, the column cage during the, the patching where you can kind of see the reinforcing steel there. And again, there's been a, been a section loss on that reinforcing steel, but over here to the right, here's an actual modern column cage just from comparison. And uh, not only is there more steel inside, there's, you know, the, the steel is a higher grade of steel, 
you know, there's, there's just a lot tighter spacing. It's just that's what a typical page these days would look like for a similar column. Uh, and going on here, uh, again, the, in terms of just the structural condition, um, again, uh, we did some uh, inspection work 13, 14 years ago, 2006, 2007, and this is memorialized in a, in a final report that was released in 2018. And what we found in looking at that report, we rated the whole structure in overall poor condition. Um, you can see here where poor sits on the, on the scale from good to critical. The other reason it was rated at four, again, was the chloride content or the salt content of the concrete that I mentioned that we went through. And then uh, again, the, the corrosion continues. And, you know, it still hasn't, still hasn't been uh, contained. And uh, of course, there's, there's a number of seismic deficiencies that, that would need to be addressed in the concrete bridge. And then finally, one thing I want to touch on is sea level rise. That's something that's very important to this project. It's a, it's a big consideration. Um, as you might be aware, there's already flooding that occurs along the strand way, uh, certain storm events. And uh, so that's something we need to take into account. Um, we're, we're considering up to six and a half feet of sea level rise again. Some of that is based on permitting requirements and stuff that we're looking at. But again, we're, we're doing a very detailed uh, hydraulic evaluation and seeing how that impacts the project. Uh, Rick? Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Uh, again, Rick Espana with RT Architects, the principal at RT. And uh, we've been working with Bob and Nickel, uh, actually, both way back. So it's actually, could be further back to the engineering master plan with uh, Matt here. Uh, that goes back to 2006. Mm -hmm. So, very familiar with the site and uh, with the project. And part of our role is to help um, not only develop plans for uh, the reconstruction or replacement of the pier bridge, but also the lifeguard facility itself. And we've designed a few lifeguard facilities, and the common rule is maximize public safety but also minimize impacts to, uh, to public needs. And that's always, it's always, you know, we, we need to have more facility, but at the same time, let's not do it at the cost of, of uh, impacting public or public use. Um, obviously, you know, this is a great location for them. Uh, they can see both north and south of the pier. Uh, it's got great access, so the location is perfect. However, it's subject to flooding. It's, already way too small and like they have about 52 lockers and uh, I think they have about 90 plus lifeguards that, that work out of this facility so it's it's very tight and then storage is obviously very tight too so they need more space they need more more area to do what they do so what we've done is uh, working with the lifeguards and understanding the requirements both currently and in the future we came up with a, a design strategy how can we Get more space without impacting the views, and also making sure that you know, if the pier is rebuilt or, or remodeled, that we don't interrupt that one too. So this is a plan view. It's just a high-level concept. It's a, it's a design strategy that we came up with. Obviously, you know, on the on the far left, you'll see this is the lifeguard deck here. Right here. A lifeguard facility below that. We have the north deck, the south deck. Uh, here is Pacific Street here. Here is the existing stairs, uh, just in terms of orientation. So one of the things we're looking at is, is of course, the existing uh, tin dishes right here in between the two decks. So we, we thought, okay, how can we expand this without going beyond the existing footprint? Uh, so we looked at this area as a strategy. Can, can we look at this for development or some kind of whether it's a single or two story structure. Um, in this case, here we're, we're thinking of we'll a, a two level structure that actually gives you a new, new deck uh, off of Pacific Street. We know in the summertime that gets pretty crowded, pretty busy. So we thought maybe that could actually help relieve some of the pressure from people walking along that sidewalk. So maybe we give the, you know, potentially give the lifeguard facility here and then develop if this is a double, um, a, a two level structure, maybe redo the. Uh, 
commercial space below. So just to kind of help illustrate that, here's a, just a, a diagrammatic section view of our architecture. Again, just a strategy on how can we how we can get that initial space. Let's start. So again, here's Pacific Street up here. Um, can we develop some kind of a, a, a staggered type of structure? So you're not looking if you are at the lower level, you're not looking at a big wall. Uh, again, the existing tin fish is probably right around here. Uh, potentially, could we do some kind of two-level structure that stepped up to uh, uh, Pacific Street? Give the lifeguards their additional space, and then maybe recreate a, a, a newer uh, or nicer uh, commercial component. So again, the tin fish there, and uh, replacing that with a newer facility. Uh, potentially, in, in the center, maybe there's again we're not really developing the plaza just yet. We have to coordinate this on the other project that's more in south of this, but there could be you know, right back some of the kiosks, and that's again that's just a high level idea. And uh, you know, again, the lifeguard station here, we can remodel that, redo that, give them a new modern facility that's state of the art. So um, again, uh, oh, and one other item too, we do need to provide ADA access from Pacific Street down to the lower level. Um, so if, if we oops, press the button, if we do um, look at creating a new development for here. We possibly could, could study the integration of an elevator that takes you down from Pacific Street down to this intermediate lifeguard level. Even we can probably reactivate some of these, uh, the old restroom with some kind of use too. We haven't thought about what that use is, but I'd love to get feedback on that. And then ultimately down to the, um, the strand level here. So that would solve several things. Obviously, you know, we would have to study this. Is there a way we can hide it? Is there a way we can ramp down to it? Um, it's just one idea. One idea of many. So uh, I think that's all I have right now. But we look forward to reading your comments and, and hearing, uh, hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Rick. All right. Uh, let's wrap it up here. Uh, so, what's going on moving forward? Uh, well, today we're here to hear from you, the public, uh, and you know, we really want to get some input. Uh, right now, we're in the, the phase one. Uh, which is running through the fall of this year. Um, after we go back to the drawing board after today, we're, we're, we're anticipating a, a second public meeting. There's probably more stuff for you guys to look at sometime in October. And that'll get after that meeting, everything will get wrapped into a feasibility study that the delivery to the city. Uh, we're doing the environmental phase through summer of 2023. Uh, then after that, we'll be working on the construction documents like the plans and uh, through fall of 2024. And soon after fall of 2024, ideally construction would start and wrap up sometime in spring of 2026. And uh, again, uh, we're here to hear from the public. We, we really want to know what you guys think. And so, Again, the, the question we're posing to everyone here today and on Zoom is you know, what matters most to you for this project? And uh, we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Thank you. How do you propose protecting it from sea level rise? Well, if, if you meet the lights are station where it's at. Well, one thing we're looking at is maybe some sort of uh, a little bit of a managed retreat for the lifeguards that uh, keep their storage area down down lower where it's uh, it, you know some kind of flood could occur uh, but uh, that's something we're, we're really we're really uh, looking at and we're trying to uh, get into here in the next coming months so. I've contemplated this for a while, and I know it really needs to tie in to the other project. So it should be kind of a master plan before we do something here. But what about the concept? Since it sounds like we need to tear this thing down and rebuild, what if they took a few parking spaces off of the street and bring a ramp down underneath the street, like we do under the railroad tracks? For all the heavy traffic, because all the new hotels, all the traffic on the Pacific backs up for a mile or so every weekend and other, other some other time. Uh, if they brought that down and made a grand entrance underneath the street, right. I know it's more cost, utility and everything. Right. But you 
solve some of your ADA issues and maybe just come down the middle where the middle between these with a similar architectural feel for what is there and maybe move the, the uh, lifeguards out of that space. They, they take up a lot of parking space there too. I, I visit there all the time on all my commutes and stuff. And they, they, take, they have a lot of parking down on the beach, takes the beach space away, and they're susceptible to the, the high tides and everything else. We have a new police station uh, restroom down the beach. You could use a little bit of heavy parking on the, the lifeguards already have a tower out on the pier to watch the water, right? They got towers all along the beach. So their headquarters facility could relocate. And then maybe working with the Rex center area to develop some kind of food court for all these other uses. Well, I, I think those are all some good points and stuff we, we've been talking about internally. You know this, the lifeguards do like where they're at currently. <laughs> and, uh, and also, we need to weigh their needs as well. But, uh, One of the things that I haven't seen any comments or information on, on some of the preliminary work, like on the, the rec center and the amphitheater circulation, vehicles or, or pedestrian circulation, it talks about it, but it doesn't show it. It talks about vehicle circulation. There's a lot of people up and down that strand. I tend to go through there on a bicycle most of the time, and it's it's a, a mess, especially with all the new um, food vendors and their sheds all over the place. Right, right. And they're using a lot of that sh storage up there now. Yeah, and I think that's something to be good for the beachfront study you mentioned, and I'm covering that here. Um, I don't know, Dara, do you have anything to add? Uh, we're going to be yeah. having our first public outreach meeting on the um, beachfront okay. facility next Tuesday, but I'm just going to bring back to one point. Um, our first meeting is just to inform everyone what the study is, where we're at, and with some staying comments because we, we, we acknowledge and are very aware that these two areas definitely overlap, and we want to make sure we can really you know, get this improvement for each other. And again, I think that that meeting is. Next Tuesday at six o'clock at that council chamber. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's here. Oh, it's here. Sorry. Okay. One one other last thing. Okay. Oh, sure. Instead of the elevator, elevators are tied to um, maintenance. And, uh, you know, the average public can't always get in. Um, I'm actually an architect and I put them in. And to get, there's enough slope there to be able to get ramps. As they have down the beach by Tyson. And there's, there's just another spot or two there. Yeah. Um, I would recommend something like that. It gets a lot larger crowd too when you're coming down to the amphitheater for concert or whatever. Yeah, we've got to, yeah, that's certainly some stuff we've been looking at, but we also need to try to work our access in with stuff that we can on the central side on that, really from the amphitheater. Uh, yes, that's uh, yeah. Ramps are certainly a little bit simpler than elevators. Uh, they serve a lot more people. Than the same, the same purpose. Yeah. Has there been any uh, effort to do uh, size the cost of reconstruction versus new construction? Uh, yeah, there was a, a cost study. Yeah, this is uh, about five years ago. Um, I can tell you that study like, again. It, um, the components of the product are uh, slightly different, but the, the the rehabilitation or the restoration was about forty percent more in terms of overall cost uh, than, uh, than the replacement in time or reconstruction. But again, that was that was a while ago. That's something that's something we're working on here. Part of this project. Did you say that the that the recon that the um, the new construction was less expensive than the restoration. Yes. Yeah. And with a longer service life. Right. And yeah, Tom had hit on that. The service life is, yeah. you know, something brand new from scratch. We can, you know, do 75 to 100 years. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, I'm sorry I walked in late, but I have already gotten a presentation. I understand that some folks think our heritage organization has been reached out to, yep. as well as uh, um, John Daly yep. regarding the, the historic uh, yep. significance of the pier, and uh, they would be happy to keep it actually rebuilding it to bring it down and rebuilding it would actually be a change in ground. Yeah, thank you. Mayor Sanchez. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Uh, yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we we reached out to John Daly and also uh, uh, Soho, and then I think uh, Wayne Donaldson. You know, on behalf of the city, uh, very similar presentation. And uh, again, those gentlemen are kind of specialists in restoration. They have a lot of long history in the city of Oceanside. I'll make sure we're doing it right. So, what else? I have yes. Questions. When you show the diagram about the, the metal that you would use to be with you, sure. um, uh -huh. it didn't appear to be coated at all. Is it going to be coated with metal so that it won't rust? Yeah, so that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's interesting. I think this one actually has epoxy coated. Rebar ties, um, but or reinforcement steel. And you can kind of look at some samples back there. We have some pieces of the concrete out of the old pier and what modern reinforced concrete, including reinforcement steel, looks like. But yeah, there's a there's a time and a place that sometimes you use a, a epoxy coated reinforcing steel. There's other higher levels of steel you can look at. But yeah, certainly, you know, here we are 93 years later, we, we have a lot better technology. In terms of uh, what goes into our concrete, and what, and what goes into you know overall design and, and looking at corrosion, and uh, you know, we're, at, uh, we're way ahead of the times here, 93 years later. So, but when you went to the repair before, I don't think they used that right. They just used regular wear before. I believe they used plain reinforcing steel. And yeah, that's correct. They used plain reinforcing steel. Place what they call anodes in there to try to control some of the salts attacking the rebar. But in general, the, most of the rebar that was placed in 1927 was saving by this. So, yeah, they think that repair efforts were pretty much superficial. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to the I don't understand the historical designation requirements. It sounds like you're, we're either going to repair in place and make it look like it used to, or as close as possible, or rebuild a completely new one that looks like the existing one. Are we required? Is there some law that forces us to stick to this? I mean, it is a beautiful structure, right. but you know, it could also be spectacular if there were some totally new architectural element to it. Right. That uh, this doesn't contain. It seems like that's a design constraint that is uh, is driving everything we're going to do here. Right. And, right. So, and what's the cost of violating that that right. guideline? Right. So to answer the first part of the question, I have Tom Tom chimed in here as well. But uh, this is kind of an example that Tom is pointing at here, where you know here's the, the this is just an example of the existing column uh, and what's there now versus okay we, we, we're trying to uh, do a restoration but we kind of have this concrete core in the middle no, of i understand it really yeah slightly, but what is the requirement right. for us to do this are we being forced by the federal government because of a historical designation or is it just a public demand that it looked the same or what, what what's driving this requirement to keep it looking almost like the existing one. I mean, even in the same shape with, with two right. sides and all that stuff. Right. So what is um, So this, the, the Games Administrative Association is the consultant that was by them from together. Uh, so it, it, it is considered historic. And um, by CEQA standards, um, it's definitely considered historic. And it's a CEQA? Uh, CEQA, yeah. That requires uh, historic? Okay. What's that? I didn't know CEQA had anything to do with historic, so that's interesting. Well, so uh, when you get a bill, essentially CEQA is the California Environmental um, right. Agency. And uh, essentially, when you get a building like this, I mean, CEQA kind of 
uh, black power that gets into the building as part of the environment. And oh, okay. so to remove a building like this, um, there would be significant mitigation required um, to establish that. Um, and that's where all of the legal uh, stuff comes into play. Um, and I think I think Jason or Barbara will chime in here. Yeah. Okay. Just to, to build on what Tom is saying, California Environmental Quality Act requires evaluation of historic okay. integrity, its character design features, uh, its local designation, all relevant components that we have to evaluate. Uh, the idea of preservation and or restoration, those two processes are looked through the same single lens. Just how they potentially either preserve and or restore the historic integrity of the facility. A new structure completely different from the old one it would be a very challenging undertaking and it would, it would compromise the historic integrity of the structure. Uh, and it has local significance, it has a local icon. So uh, those features. But so so it's, it's just the process that would see, take, see, take see, the, the cost too? I mean, you, have, you said mitigations. That means. You have to donate something to a historical society, something to offset it. It can be multiple, come in multiple forms. Uh, mitigation could be a historic restoration, uh, which would involve some of the options you evaluated. Uh, mitigation would be in kind replacement. Uh, mitigation could also be what's called the recordation process, where all of the existing structure, the structure existing, existing historic features are all recorded uh, and they're archived. Uh, if hypothetically something different was going to exist. But as, as Jared and everything you heard, we're evaluating those and contributing to the evaluation process to determine what's the best option for the city to explore and to deploy. Right. We're simply a, a contributor to that effort looking through the CEQA lens. Does that answer your question? It helps. So if, so if we made a change, let's say we didn't want the lifeguard station to be down there, we want it to be open. Uh, because of sea level rise or some other requirement, that would be a change from the current architecture. We'd have to go into a wait for a waiver from historical designation or something. The, the, the lifeguard facility is not part of the original historic monument. It's a, it's well, was it, it, was a, it was a restaurant. It was a dining room. Well, that portion. I'm just saying that out, outer part. You said you weren't going to use that. Could, could you? Could you go through a change process to change from that? Because this, this historical designation is, is really forcing you to a, a certain shape and size and, and everything else. That's a real driving factor in this whole design decision, right? It's probably one of yes. the largest driving factor. And it's a question of how much can you bend that or change it to adapt to the sea level rise or well, environmental? Our, our contribution from the environmental process perspective to analyze, document, and then inform the city issues making process. The decision may ultimately what is done with this facility, whether it's restoration replacement or an entire new facility, is ultimately the city's decision. Right. We 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 would facilitate that through the CEQA process and inform their decision. That's that's our role to help with expertise, to advise, and to document. That's our role. And then working with the heritage architects and our team. Making sure that we have completely vetted all of the best options, those that fit the public's desire, the public safety and privacy lifeguard, historic designation, its use as a recreational and social facility. That's what we're here for. Uh, and your inputs and your ideas are what's the most, most important. And the last slide said, what is the most important function is a security factor as well. Yeah. And, and keeping with that concept, even though the Fight Guard Station was a remodel of an old dining facility. What if that was converted back to a dining facility? That might supplement this. I mean, if you had something kind of like the tin fish moved down there and they had outdoor, they could have outdoor seating, right? Watch our slaves, right? Instead of being tucked in the back corner, right? Um, yeah, that would seems, seems logical. I could, I, I don't, <laughs> I want to be safe someday. You're causing us a lot of trouble with all that. <laughs> I would like to see the lifeguards accommodate if possible. Yeah. That's just my own view. They serve a very strong role in the city. They, through their junior lifeguard program, they, they generate 
fine citizens, I'm all for supporting the life parts and trying to accommodate them to what they need. Um, there's no, is there, anyone, uh, uh, there's no question. Is there any questions? No, no, no. Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right, I do have one last question. Is this is this the last um, open meeting for the public input? No. Okay. So, because I do think this needs to be tied in with the other beach improvement projects. And and I spoke at the meeting we had few weeks ago, right. you know, this is a huge undertaking. Um, it's going to be a lot of demolition. You know, it's going to be a lot of downtime down there, which is going to affect tourism, and also the people of Oceanside. So I think this really has to be scheduled in with the other work that's going on down there. Right. So we, we obviously are we're working hand in hand with the, the beachfront study. Again, uh, Dara, who's, uh, you know, the, the PM on this project, uh, she's the PM of that project as well. So a pretty open line of communication there and uh, again in terms of uh, you know in terms of the construction staging it's it, it, it could be tough to um, could be tough to try to do the pier after all that work's done so the going thought is maybe the pier would be built first before those groups but again we're looking at everything I believe it's a safety issue, isn't it? It's tumbling, we need to do something about it quickly. I mean, right. I thought that the timing was uh, one from the essence kind of situation. Is that true? Or I mean, that's why it should be a separate, a separate project. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, this, this, this structure has been crumbling for quite some time. So it's very important to not, you know, let it go down the road another decade or two or something like that, you know. So that's you're right. That's that's why uh, that's why we're doing it now. So is it is it structurally sound? It looks like it, you know if everything goes to plan, 2026, we may have a new bridge. Is it structurally sound until that time, or the city does not have to put any more money into it? Well, I, you know. We don't know what the future holds. Uh, we only know what we we've looked at. Uh, certainly, we know where there's some deficiencies. Uh, um, you know, the codes changed over 93 years. Um, you know, there's certainly better ways of doing things. But you know, the the real answer is, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's been here 93 years, yeah. and there's any number of events that can take down any structure at any time. We just don't we don't know. So. I think one of the things that we have a look at this case is, you know, we have that rating range from four to critical, and we're not at the critical stage, we're not at you know, the perfect stage. So, um, again, that's why it's quite important, not only because it, it has a more sense of urgency because of its condition, but also it, some of the cost and foundations that are going to the structure are going to be significantly larger than that we anticipated. You see what they're, that's, they're not. So, for us, to do the work currently or even the year after the other project, there would be a lot of damage any you know future improvements to their projects. So before with this one, we address a you know more more I would say urgent but more timely concern. Right? To get this ahead of the other project is is what we discussed with Dara's team and now they're staying on this project as well, is that the timing of it and the coordination, most projects are phased, you know, there's always some coordination of phasing out the build portion of the plan. Uh, you can see that in the fact that we're moving forward with the beachfront phase one. That project is you know, uh, months off of being completed. So, um, coordination effort is there. The project has a priority because there's more immediate needs that you would have at the end of the theater, uh, which, again, the knowledge you use it isn't as much as you use it with the, the, the you know, service. The safety aspect we talked about is, is essential because we're putting the life program, but we know we're going to have people in the area. We know we're making improvements that's going to draw more people to the area. So, we get a, need that essential function of the life part established to draw more people in to devastate the visit in the area. Going back to the de designation of four, you had a study done in 2006, 2007, and 2018. When was it designated as being four? Well, it, that study was that, that study was finalized in 2018. Okay. So, Matthew, so, yeah, uh, hi, uh, Matthew Martinez, I was the Structural engineer that did the 2006 work 
close of 2018 work and uh, as part of our 2018, uh, yeah, 2018 finishing up the report. Um, we uh, found quite a bit of damage 2006 and we rated it as fair at that time. And indeed, the city has, uh, you know, gone through certain processes which gotten us to this point, including a patching program that was articulated in uh, 2016 and 2017. As we saw what happened with the patching and got a closer look, and then with the passing of uh, what, uh, 15 years from 2006, it switched from fair down to four. Your question is a good one, though, as to is it safe? And uh, what we've said is that, you know, it's really a matter of risk. And when you look at this from an earthquake perspective, uh, if you got the right earthquake at the right proximity and the right acceleration, not to get too wonky to it uh, with the site and ground motion, uh, you could get some considerable damage out of onto that structure. Mix in the fact that it's in a degraded condition, the uh, damage could be more severe. But we think the patching that's taken place at least extends and you know has moderated the level of risk to what it was before that for the next four or five years. You go beyond that, uh, we probably be recommending that be short. Sure. Yes, uh, so you're talking about uh, speaking to the other uh, projects that are going on. Right. Is there anything going on with the actual pier itself? Uh, there is a maintenance project right now where the uh, public works department is replacing water and sewer lines on that. So when we go and modify this project, we'll be upgrading everything in connection between the wood portion and then into the strand. Most of the services that go down the pier are underneath the strand. So there'll be coordination and reconfiguration utilities, depending on what we put um, at the, the bottom of the structure with the concrete structure matching the wood portion. So yeah, there's the new teammates going on over the years. We've done deck replacement, we've done cross-based replacement. So there's annual projects that's matched by our public work, work group that looks at that cost base. And Matthew is also involved with that. Uh, we did the report for the, the underwater and above water inspection, and out of that began a program that I guess is pretty much complete now, a replacement of the cross bracing, the X bracing for the piling, and uh, and my it's an ongoing replacement of the deck where it gets really rough and becomes an ADA uh, issue or if you ever take a baby buggy over there, it's just really rough. So there's ongoing things structurally. Is there also um, a rating that you've done on that? On the pier itself? Or? Uh, yeah, that's all in that report, which I think is, is uh, publicly available, whether or not we call it. What we do is we rate individual components and then roll that up into a larger overall rating. And other than the cross bracing and some of the decking, which were rated as four, and a couple places we've been uh, critical, uh, they've subsequently been replaced. So I think you can consider that. Uh, peer structure as probably being in, uh, you know, a fair condition at this point. I keep in mind it was designed in 1989. It was designed by the Floor Corporation, an excellent uh, engineering entity. And all those drawings, it says 25 years as a design service line for that structure. So 1989 to uh, uh, current at uh, 25 to 89, and that's 62 about 2014 or thereabouts. So, anything we get out of that is gravy. And of course, as we keep fixing and repairing out of what we call sustainment, you know, we're extending that. But those timber structures don't last forever. So, uh, you arguably would be uh, replacing the bridge if that's where the way this goes, or, or reconstructing it. Um, either way, uh, but um, you'd end up with a bridge that has a lot longer service life than the timber pier that's out in front. And down the road, that timber pier will need to be addressed, but that's uh, an issue for a different day. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I had asked uh, the, the uh, costing question earlier, but you're right. talking about, you gave me an answer of the cost differential between the new construction and the re and the reconstruction. 
Right. Do we have an estimate of what the overall project would cost? Is it 10 million, 20 million? Well, well it, it's hard for us to put a number on it right now because of, you know, we got to solve the life card. Uh, right, but you, you, you have sure. a general idea of what range you're in. Right? Well, back then, um, if I recall the numbers again, and again, it wasn't quite the same project. We were in the, you know, the, the 20 to $30 million range with some of those numbers. Uh, but yeah, we have to, we got to figure out what we're doing and put cost to that. That will all come out in our feasibility study, which is kind of the end of this first phase here. And, uh, you know, I guess we got a little bit. Some of the numbers that we had, um, we basically determined to be on rough order magnitude of estimate. So we don't have all the details of the structure. But the number that you based on 3% earlier was a, a replacement of about $19 million and a retrofit of $26 million. So while those numbers are going to vary based on zero costs, I mean, we, we all want to fit the Home Depot, but this year we saw a massive spike in rubber costs. So while those prices fluctuate, that difference of about 40% probably going to stay pretty consistent no matter what option we go with, no matter how the cost, oil well, cost, not big cost, rebar cost, wood cost. All those costs are going to vary for the next couple years, but that gap of 40% is probably going to stay pretty consistent with whatever option is going And David, those numbers that you cited, did not include anything substantial from one press aspect. So um, is the city then prepared to uh, support that type of a cost? I mean, is the budget set up to be able to handle it? Well, given we're a five-year program, not yet. We're looking at different options. There's, we hear on the federal government level about infrastructure projects. We're going to look at the possibilities of getting a single funding that option. Um, I spent a lot of time early on. Um, I have a couple of different projects here in town with bridge projects. I actually came with those inside that to go uh, to Sim Street over uh, Seventh Great River to the harbor, my first project here. Uh, but there are funding programs. They have a, a bridge program that at one point they were doing inspections in the city, the state of California was inspecting the pier. The pier is no longer eligible for that funding source. So we do have to look at different avenues. And that's why we start early. Uh, some of the concepts we look at is can we, are we all, you know, we look at a park requirements for the project, um, transportation. We do look at different options that are available in different funding sources. The city manager's office has grant writers that can help, you know, pursue different funding sources. But we look at those options about funding special projects. Did you bring your checkbook with you tonight? Here's seven dollars. It would probably bounce. <laughs> <laughs> Your AGM card. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Um, so I'm Yeah, it was pretty much important for us to um, make sure we had a single point of contact for this project. I'll be involved because I've been involved for so long, so uh, we've got plenty of stuff to do with the city. But again, thank you. This is important for us to so reach out to you, get your feedback. Initial steps were really early on in the initial steps. Also, keep in mind that one of the things I want to point out before we close out is you know, we're talking about 100 year service life, and we start talking about sea level rise, and you may expect a couple inches here and there over the years. But we're projecting out almost 100 years to see where the sea level is going to be to you know, accommodate the service life of the facility. So, the last thing we talked about was our second outreach meeting. We have at least two plans. We've got more thing now, each and not the response we have. We're going back our ground back with these comments. You have every opportunity, if you have another idea that comes up to you over the next couple of weeks. Reach out to us, contact us, go to that website. Our contact information is there either by email or by phone call. Drop us a, a number, and we will get your comments back to the design team. And um, that's how we'll keep you informed. We're reaching out to you. We have our, our websites, we have our newsletters. Again, there's two places you can find our overall program. It's the CIP webpage. You go to our webpage, you go to government, you go down to a development service department, engineering. Uh, if you can't find it, we'll help you get there, but we try to keep you informed. Um, as often as you want to hear about it. I think our plan is either monthly or bi-monthly right now is thinking to accelerate or we'll, we'll change that reporting period. But that information is available or just simply give us a call. Um, so again, thank you for coming out. Uh, second meeting sometime, probably later in the end of uh, the month of October, but that's still, still to be determined. We'll get the information out. 
Zoom's available. We're hoping that we're going to have a bigger turnout, but we'll try to get the word out even more about the availability for Zoom. And then we'll deal with the situations that come up. But we definitely want your input. We need to bring keep you informed. This is a, uh, the area, individual projects, and the project as a whole is a major impact to our city. We're looking for you guys to stick in there. Thank you very much for coming out today. If you do feel, if you have a slide, they haven't talked about looking at some exhibits, you can grab them, touch them, play with them, and get a feel for what we're dealing with. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.